Hi everyone. So this is office hours number two and it's a big review of big idea number one and it's hosted by me and my name is Rachel again if you guys didn't already know. So we're going to first get started with Think Fiveable. So Think Fiveable, um, Fiveable is Think Fiveable on all um, social media platforms. So if you want to post something about watching this video or the stream on um, Instagram, Fiveable will likely repost it. So go ahead and do that if you like. Um, Fiveable also has a TikTok and it's also under Think Fiveable. So um, yeah, go ahead and follow those. Um, and you can keep up with Fiveable and everything that they're doing. So on this stream, we're gonna be talking about two MCQ questions, or just MCQs, um, um, to help with exam practice. We're gonna elaborate a little bit on computing innovations. I'm gonna do a pretty high level, but in-depth overview of Big ID number one. And we're gonna have um, any Q and A if you guys have any questions. So just to get started, uh, um, I'm probably going to put this slide into every single presentation that I make just um, for general clarification. Um, a quick overview of the AP exam. There are two sections this year, so there used to be three, um, but they took out the explore because they just decided it wasn't like the best judger or use of their time. Um, so now we only have two sections. So section one um, is the end of course multiple choice exam. So you will be taking that um, either in person or online, really depending on COVID. Um, and that is a 70 multiple choice questions, 120 minutes and 70% of your score. And all the questions have four answer options. So because this is gonna be 70% of your score, you definitely need to focus a lot on practicing multiple choice, you know, getting them down and right, because you, know, you can't um, rely on the other section to bring up your score. Um, this should be the section that you are most focused on. So within section one, there's going to be 57 single select multiple choice questions. And there's also going to be five single select questions about a reading passage about a computing innovation. So as I mentioned previously, there was the explore section, but that was taken out. So now it's just um, this passage in replacement. So that might actually be easier, you know, it take less of your time. Um, most people do find computing innovation questions um, a little more intuitive because these are things that you use every single day. But it is very important um, to know the specific definitions of computing innovations so you don't get these questions wrong because, you know, as I mentioned before, they're very important. Um, and then there's going to be eight more multiple select, multiple choice answers. Um, so this is going to be when you have like, like on a Google form, when there's those, like those boxes instead of the circles that's gonna be like, you have to select um, two. So those are probably a little more challenging because you have to have like more thought, look into each one. You can't just find the right answer and then knock all the other ones out. Um, but there's only eight of those, so definitely practice them, but don't be too worried. I would worry the most about those single select multiple choice questions, especially um, computer science. Sometimes it's less intuitive than you think. Like you think it's pretty easy, but then you get into it and it's like, oh, what is this? So um, definitely focus on those multiple choice question exam um, practice problems. Um, and then the second section is gonna be the create performance task. So this has been part of the AP exam for quite a while. Um, this is gonna be 30% of your score. And this is when you're going to develop a computer program um, kind of in class. Um, your teacher will be required to give you at least 12 hours. So that's probably like two-ish weeks um, or two, a little more than two weeks. So like two weeks and a couple days. Um, but you can obviously work on it for as long as you want, as long as you turn it in before the College Board due date. I'm not exactly sure when. I'll put it on the slide um, next time. But yeah, so you, you, you need to finish that early um, so you don't have to worry about it when you're trying to prepare for um, AP exams. Um, and this is not one of the more challenging projects that you have to do. Um, this is, it's pretty clear. Um, like all the guidelines and everything in the rubric. Um, but if you do need any um, more clarification, I'm gonna definitely be making lots more videos about that particular section of the AP exam in the future. So this is kind of what we're gonna be focusing on today, the multiple choice exam questions. Um, we're gonna have two today um, to practice and these are a little more intuitive. I did not want to put one of the more complicated like algorithm questions. Um, quite yet. We're just trying to get into the multiple choice. You know, it's quite early on, 
uh, definitely just trying to get into things. So um, this question is, which of the following activities poses the greatest personal cybersecurity risk? So definitely think about what your parents say is safe or what is not on the internet, or if you've ever watched any of those, um, any of those like um, internet safety videos, definitely um, draw back to that. Um, and I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds. All right, so the correct answer is C. So it is reserving a hotel room by emailing a credit card number to a hotel. And so if you kind of look at the other answers, this is a little bit more of a straightforward answer. Um, all the other answers do mention a secure way of depositing um, like money while you know reserving a hotel um, room by calling is not necessarily the most safe. So let's talk about A. So A is making a purchase at an online store that uses public key encryption to transmit um, credit information. So how is that safe? Well, public key encryption, that is, um, if you haven't learned the definition, that's fine. Um, you can kind of, it's kind of more intuitive. You can tell that is um, a safe way of transmitting personal information online. Um, and B is paying a bill using a secure electronic payment system. So, um, how is that more safe? Well, secure electronic system, you know, it's it's a secure electronic system. So you kind of have to take it at face value. College board is telling you it's secure and it's safe. So you just have to say, okay, is it secure and safe? Like you don't really know what the system is, but that's okay. All you know is that college board thinks it's safe. So it's gonna be safe. Um, so that's kind of an obvious no for that question. Um, and then D is withdrawing money from a bank account using an automated telling machine. So withdrawing is pretty safe. You just take out your money. Um, there's no real cybersecurity risk. It's not even on the internet, really. Um, it's more of like a machine. The only thing that would like kind of involve the internet is like it's gonna go back to your bank account, but that's pretty safe. Um, and so why is C the right answer? Well, you know, emailing a credit card number to your hotel is not the best idea. Emails are easy to hack into. Um, emails are not that safe. You know, you can look at somebody's email just by opening their phone or opening their computer. So credit card information through email, not safe. Definitely not, not something to do um, all the time. And so this next question is basically there's a prompt and it says, a search engine is a trend tracking feature that provides information on how popular a search term is. Um, this data can be filtered by a geographic region date and category. Categories include art and entertainment, computers and electronics, games, news, people, and society. Um, which of the following questions is least likely to be answerable using the trends feature? So I'm going to give you guys 30 seconds again to answer this question, um, or you can just pause it and skip forward. All right, so let's see what the answer is. So the answer is C again. Um, they're not really related, but just they were C both this time and last time. Um, and this is what is the cost of a certain electronic products? So why is C the correct answer? Well, compared to the other questions, it's not really a filterable question. Um, so it's asking for a specific product. This is more of a you know filtering 
you know, search engine and you can't really filter down to like one product and its price. Um, so yeah, if you look at um, the like prompt, it says what month or what, or if you look at the question or the answer, sorry, um, it says in what month does a particular sport receive the most searches? So, you know, you can kind of filter sports and date um, based on the prompt. And then for B, which political candidates are people most interested in, um, you can kind of filter by people and society, um, you know, news, things like that. Um, and then which region of the country has the greatest number of people searching for opera performances. So that's gonna be um, um, geographic region and, you know, entertainment and arts in the, within the prompt. But for C, there's not really a way, I mean, there is an electronics category, but you can't really search for a specific price. Um, and there's no price in this, um, ge um, in this search engine. So that's how you kind of know, like that is not gonna be the correct answer because it's not even in the prompt. Um, so yeah, I hope those were easy for you guys. Um, personally, sometimes, computer science questions can seem easy um, and they seem, oh, so intuitive, you know, I got this and then you get the correct answer back and you're like, wait, what? Um, so definitely if you are taking um, this course um, with a teacher um, and it's not being self-studied, I would definitely use those um, AP, um, like my AP, AP classroom type questions um, as much as possible or ask your teacher if you can, you know, practice them because um, honestly, it just practice makes perfect. You know, if you need to um, go get a book, go, go buy a book, go borrow a book online, find a book online with these um, types of practice questions and practice, 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 because this is gonna be so important for your exam this year. Um, last year, my exam had nothing. I just had to turn in my portfolio. But this year, it's gonna be definitely more challenging for you guys because you have, you know, 70 multiple choice questions and that is a lot. Okay, so now back to the five main big ideas. There are five. Um, so creative development is 10 through um, 10 through 13 percent of your test. Then there's data, algorithms, and programming. Um, then there's going to be computer systems and networks, and the impact of computing. So if you notice, there's a significant portion of algorithms and programming. But for this stream, we're going to be focusing on creative development. So this is my idea number one, there's two, three, four, and five, and of course we're gonna be focusing on one. So these are all of the learning objectives for creative development. So, you know, 1.1, collaboration, all of those things. 1.2, um, program, function, and purpose, all of those things. I don't wanna read them out, you guys can read them if you'd like. Um, I'm gonna kind of go into them later on in the slide anyways. So yeah, so these are learning objectives. These are all take, taken straight from the AP um, CSP, C, um, course and examination description or CD, um, CED. Um, and I would recommend reading that um, if you can. I honestly knew that they existed, but I didn't think they were, that, they were that helpful until I saw, I think it was like a TikTok that said, this is the guide that your teachers are using to teach you. And after every single one of these main ideas um, and other um, course and examination descriptions, that, um, it's like after each unit. But for this, after each main idea, you have to be able to answer these questions or else you did not learn the unit properly. And they also kind of help you know what you need to, um, you know, kind of figure out if you don't know them. So definitely um, make sure you know all of these, make sure you can answer all of these front and back, make sure you know them like in your heart um, and you will do fine on the eighth exam, I promise. This is literally straight from College Board so they know exactly what they're gonna test you on. Um, and then, Moving on, there is 1.3 and 1.4. 1.3 is going to be program design and development, and then 1.4 is correctly identifying and correcting errors. So big idea number one, creative development. Um, basically, in big picture, it is College Board is saying when developing convening innovations, developers can use formal um, design processes or iterative design processes, which we will go into later, um, or you can just, you know, do like a more free flowing way of experimentation um, because of this like 
iterative design process. Developers will encounter many different phases within their process. And um, you know, some of these phases are like investigating, reflecting, prototyping, testing, designing, things like that. Um, and then you also have to know how important collaboration is um, in any phase of development and within the big picture of the world for computing innovations. So collaboration overview. Collaboration is so important because the technology created will be applicable to a larger audience if there is more collaboration. Collaboration can lead to a more relevant product that had a size to an audience's tar um, target need because if you think about it, um, more people, there's more perspectives, people can vouch for things that they, they know are more important and other people can kind of bounce ideas back and forth to come up with the best product. Um, different team members can use their different talents um, and expertise on the final community innovation. So, you know, everyone has their talents, everyone has their strengths. You know, your whole strength could be just, you know, computer science, but guess what? Um, there's other people who are good at, you know, public speaking, good at um, design, things like that, that will help create the product um, of a computing innovation into a much more well-developed design because there's not only one perspective or person working on it. Um, and then also, lastly, a diverse team creates a computing innovation that reduces biases within the computing innovation itself. So what does this mean? Uh, I've kind of used this example before, but within artificial intelligence, there are biases. And you're like, why? Like, how is this a thing? Like, it's, it's a, um, artificial intelligence. But, you know, um, lots of artificial intelligence was created by um, a very particular type of person. So like a male, um, like a, a cis male, right? And so for people, um, a cis white male. And so for people of color or people who are, you know, genderless or people who are female, they are not recognized as well by um, these AI technologies. And why is that? It's because they are created by only one type of person. So they were only tested and thought out for one type of person. So they don't really work for all the other types of people in the world, which shows how computing innovations reflect um, internal biases that are not necessarily intended, but they do cause big, um, you know, long-term effects. Um, and you can read more about this online. You know, there's an article that we had to read for a class once um, where this girl remembered how she, um, this girl, person of color, who's a person of color, she realized that she could not be recognized by like AI. And so she had to put on a literal mask um, to be recognized by the AI, which is honestly like quite, um, you know, intense. Like it's a very strong symbolism and realization to know that computing innovations can reflect internal biases. Um, and that kind of shows the importance of collaboration. So kind of moving on from that, what is a computing innovation? So according to College Board, the direct um, definition of a computing innovation is a um, innovation that includes a program as an integral part of its function. Um, so basically the main backbone of a innovation has to be programming um, or program to be considered a computing innovation. So examples of different computing innovations. So physical, you know, self-driving car, um, non-physical um, computing software, um, picture editing software, um, non-physical computing concept, e-commerce. So those are all things that require um, programming as a major part of um, their backbone. So that is how um, those are computing innovations. So once again, like I mentioned before, computing innovations will appear in your AP exam for, um, in the form of um, a reading passage and five single select questions. So definitely these are important, but definitely don't worry too much. You know, missing five questions is not ideal, but if it has to be done, you know, that's okay. But definitely just for um, clarity's sake, I would just learn this really quickly what computing, computing innovations are because they're quite easy to learn. Um, and once you get the hang of things, you really don't go back. So what is not considered a computing innovation? There's lots of things. So a digital clock, fiber optic cables, um, Bitcoin, police lighting cameras, and wireless phone charging. So digital clock, there's not um, programming, or there is programming involved, especially in certain digital clocks. However, it's not the um, integral part of its like innovation. Um, there's a lot of like more hardware things, like you know, electronic, like LED things, there's there's a lot more behind a digital clock than just programming, and it's not the main part of the innovation, so that's not going to be a computing innovation. So fiber optic, optic cables, those are going to just be more considered like a piece of hardware, 
you know, so those are the cables that run underneath the um, ocean and bring the internet everywhere, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so those are not that we consider a continuing innovation as well. And so Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a bit of a tough one. Most people um, kind of argue over this, but College Board does say that Bitcoin is not, um, well, I'm not sure if College Board says that, but most um, computer science teachers do agree that Bitcoin is not going to be a computing innovation. And honestly, when it comes to computing innovations, I would say steer clear of the ones that are kind of in between and just know the ones that are um, for sure 100% always considered computing innovations, um, just so you don't have to, because argue kind of with, within yourself on that, like when you're seeing those questions on the test, because um, college board questions are not really objective. They, they're they always looking for the correct answer um, and you can't really argue with them. So, you know, make sure you know like the bounds and limits of computing innovations very well. And the last two are pretty obvious. Um, there's not a huge amount of programming involved. Um, if there is, it's not the main part of the innovation. So, you know, that's not gonna be considered a computing innovation. So learning objectives. So now you should be able to explain how computing innovations are improved through collaboration and also explain how computing innovations are developed by groups of people. And also this is an add on, you should know what is considered computing, computing innovation and what is not considered a computing innovation. So moving on, what is the purpose of a computing innovation? Well, the purpose um, of computing innovations are to solve problems or showcase creativity through an innovation done on a computer program. So why is it significant? Well, if you know the purpose of a computing innovation, it can help you lead to creating better ones um, or being able to better understand the purpose, um, which allows you to develop innovations that are more effective. So vocabulary. Um, what is a program? A program is several statements or instructions that complete a task or an object when run on a software. So programs are also known as software. Um, and that is a word that you will use interchangeably. So I'm going to use them inter interchangeably in this video as well. Um, so what is a code segment? So a code segment is several program statements or instructions or pieces of software um, that create a full program when combined together. So within a program, there's program statements and within um, several program statements, there is like one big code segment. So what is the behavior of a program? Well, a the behavior of a program is what a program does when it's being run on a computer um, or basically how a user might interact um, with this program. So um, kind of going a little off, um, software, you kind of know what that means now it's a program, but on the other hand, hardware are the physical components that run the software and you will definitely learn more about you know, hardware um, later on, but that's just like a kind of good contrast to um, remember. So programs, how can they be described? They can be described in two ways. So they can be described by what they accomplish or by the exact program statements. So for example, for a program that's adding one plus one, you could say it adds, like the program adds. And then for um, you know number two, you could say the program system takes in variable A, um, which is set to one, and variable B, which is set to two, and it um, adds B and A together, equaling the um, answer of C, which is going to be um, three. Sorry, I just forgot my simple math there. But yeah, so those are different ways that you can describe programs. So different types of inputs. So what are inputs? Input is a data from the user or other programs on, com on a computer that is sent to be processed by a piece of hardware computer um, through programs or software. And so there's lots of different types of inputs. You can kind of read them out here. The only one that to me that is really quite confusing is tactile. And that is, you know, if you look at your phone, I don't really have my phone with me right now, but if you have your phone right here and you click on it here, that is gonna be a type of input because that is a um, touch type on your screen. I mean, also, you know, typing, those are gonna be strokes on your keyboard and that's also gonna be an input. So something called an event must occur for inputs to be received by a computer. Um, the event would be you, you know, tapping the phone. And that is going to um, supply data or the input that the program uses. And so these are some examples, um, and you can read them out. Um, and that's going to be all events that cause, you know, data to be received by the software. 
Um, and so nowadays, a majority of software um, is event driven. So what does that mean? Event driven, that means that the program will not start um, until the event occurs. Um, additionally, outputs are data that is returned after the entire program is um, input with, or the entire program with the input in it is executed. So majority of the time, the type of input directly affects the output. So if, for example, going back to the adding question, if you input one and two, um, the answer is going to be three, and that's going to be the output. Um, however, if you start inputting like three and seven, um, the output is going to be, you know, two plus seven, which is going to be nine. So, you know, that's going to directly affect the output. So now after this, you should be able to describe the purpose of a computing innovation, explain how a program or code segment functions, identify inputs into a program, and identify outputs produced by a program. So next um, is going to be program design and development. So there are many different types of development processes. So the most common phases of program development are going to be investigating and reflecting, designing, um, prototyping, and testing. So iterative development is a process where the development process continues to cycle over and over again until the product is um, finished into a final product. Um, and so this is kind of going to be where you just keep on going over the design process over and over again until you finally come up with the um, exact design that you would like. Um, incremental development is when um, the main problem or task is broken down into several different pieces so that the developer can determine if the piece works. Ooh, I think um, the sentence is not finished. That's a little embarrassing. But yeah, so basically each part of the, um, the program is broken down into little mini parts so you can solve those problems and hopefully in the final um, in the final project solve the big large problem. Um, and so usually you will see iterative design development um, used, um, but incremental development is just as good. So program documentation. So what is program documentation? It is the description of the function of code and how the code was developed um, and why should it be done? It should be done all throughout the um, um, entire process of creating code because it will help you um, collaborate with your peers much, much better and help you and your peers understand code because I'm not sure um, how much coding you guys have done, but even like in, you know, homework, if you are, you know, doing a project and it's really complicated and um, it's like in a different language, maybe in Spanish, and then you go back and you have no idea like what you're doing. Like you, you completely forgot, you know, it's been like a couple of days, you have no idea what's going on now. It's very helpful for coding specifically if you write down what the um, what the goal of the code is and like what you're doing just to kind of, you know, help that process of returning back to the code much easier because, you know, it is in a different language. You are learning the language as you go. Um, very complicated. Um, and so comments are directly written to, into the code. And so they kind of look like program statements. Um, but um, there is always a special symbolism for um, the code. So in Java, it's like two backslashes. Um, and I think in Python, it's a backslash and a uh, asterisk, I'm not sure though, um, and those will kind of like gray them out and so they won't actually affect your program at all and you can put them anywhere in your program, but they will like provide you with um, some like easy, I guess easy statements to look at. And just as a general note, not all um, IEDs have a comment feature. So IEDs are like the environment in which you code in. Um, most nowadays do, however, um, some do, do not, so with that, you would have to kind of write it down um, pen to paper, but that's also fine too. Um, that works just as well. So program design and development, just like copyright laws, um, citing the sources when you're coding is so, so important. Um, make sure you are allowed to use the code, uh, code as a starting point, ask your teacher if you need that, um, and then even afterwards, you, may, you should make sure to cite your, the code itself. Um, and so this citation is pretty similar to like kind of like an MLA type thing, like a Purdue OWL type feat. Um, and these citations should be done using a comment within the code file that you're working on. There's lots of different um, rules, you know, going back to the Purdue OWL type of thing. And you can click them in this workbook here. Um, kind of, it's going to be, you can just search up, you know, workbook um, for code um, cite citations or something like that, and it should pop up. 
Um, and so usually when acknowledging the original creator of code, you're going to include the access date. So that's the day that you found the code, link to the website where the code was found, a retrieval date, a retrieval date, that's sorry, that's kind of the same thing. I'm super, super sorry about that. Um, I need to take that off of the slide. Um, the origin and the original creator's name. So now you should know how to develop a program using um, a development process. Develop, that should not be on there twice, I'm so sorry. Um, describe a purpose of a code segment by, or program by writing documentation um, and acknowledging code segments used from other sources. Um, and so if you look at these things and you're like, wow, like she's speaking so fast, I have no idea what she's talking about. That's okay. Just need, you just need to know like before the AP exam, you know, before May, um, you need to know all of these, you know, learning objectives. Um, but before then, if you're a little confused, just and you need any clarification, that's fine. You just need to make sure to know them before the AP exam. So the last one, um, the last kind of slides are um, identifying and correcting errors. So some typical errors that you will see all throughout your code, um, hopefully not actually all throughout your code, but like all throughout your time coding. Um, are logic errors, syntax errors, and runtime errors, and of course, overflow errors. So a logic error is when your code actually compiles and it um, is running. However, when it outputs the answer, it is something completely wrong, like just so wrong. Um, for example, you know, if you're trying to make a program that adds two numbers and you input one plus one, and it's supposed to be two, and it, and it, um, and it, output you know 11 then it clearly it is not doing the correct addition like it's that's just not right um and so that's going to be a logic error that means there's a flaw within your code um containing like the logic it's not going to be um problem with like actually how the code is written or you know where something is placed um a syntax error is pretty common um you know those semicolons you know or those brackets if you miss a couple they're out forever and they will ruin your day but the next errors are basically when the code is written improperly um, for this specific language and so it doesn't run uh, and that will definitely affect the output because there will be no output it will just straight up not run so a runtime error is when a code cannot execute a task properly as you run the code so that means the code will not run for some reason because the task um, that you are putting it in will not um, properly execute and so that's going to be considered a runtime error. And then a little bit more unique of an error is going to be an overflow error. And that is going to be when a computer is trying to handle a number outside of its range and it has to replace all the new numbers with different random values. Um, and so my example for this is going to be um, if you try to put in an int for in like a program and it's bigger than the, the biggest int um, that that particular language holds, it's going to just print out a bunch of symbols um, or just not run. So that would be also considered a, um, I think it would be considered a runtime error um, that it just wouldn't run because there's, it's just too big for the program. So that's kind of what an overflow error is. So now, how do we determine where a coding error occurs? Well, test cases, um, you can determine an error using test cases and hand using the code, visualizations, debuggers, and adding extra output statements um, all to help better understand what is wrong with your code. So test cases. So a programmer can use predetermined or predefined um, inputs to plug into a program and so you know the answer. So for example, what I was saying earlier, you would always probably put in one plus one to test a um, addition program because guess what you know the answer to one plus one it's gonna be two um, and so with the output that comes out you can determine if it's right or wrong if the program is running correctly or not so if you put in one plus one and the answer is three you know it is so there's something wrong with the code and it's not running properly I um, mean you know this because you know the correct answer um, like you know what you're supposed to get so that's kind of one way to figure out an error within your code you can also use boundary cases to test if the program is performing accurately so if the code is only going to accept numbers above one and you put in negative two and it accepts the program um, and accepts the um, in, into the program, you know it is wrong. That is not correct because it is not supposed to. So that, that's a, another way you can determine if your code is actually running properly or you're just putting in like some test cases that work. Um, and you can do the same thing um, on the other way around and that's really helpful. Um, basically, to make 
accurately um, defined inputs to test your code, you have to know all the requirements and boundaries of your code, or else all of your inputs, they might not work, and they're not supposed to work, and you wouldn't know that. So definitely make sure to know what you're supposed to be coding, make sure what your um, parameters um, are for your code, and everything will go over a lot easier. So hand tracing code, what is that? That's kind of tracing each line of code, so you don't actually have to like trace it with your hand. However, that is helpful. Um, you kind of just go line by line, so, oh, this line, this line, this line, and then you kind of can tell through the lines which one is not correct and which one is correct. So visualizing the code, there's lots of different ways to visualize the code. You can, you know, like make graph flow charts. There are visualizers online that make them for you. Um, that kind of helps you see if there's any logic errors, if you're going somewhere wrong, um, but also it kind of helps with planning your code in general. So debuggers, ooh, I never finished that sentence apparently. Um, sorry, there's a bunch of mistakes with the slide, goodness. Um, these debuggers are specific um, programs that find problems within your code. So they will go line by line and they will kind of spit out what is incorrect in their program. However, you know, debuggers do work. You will not get to use them on the AP exam, obviously. I would practice hand tracing the code um, and inputting in test cases um, in like your head because this is gonna be multiple choice questions. So you kind of have to write them down. Um, and also there's gonna be um, adding extra output statements. So this is not really used as much for me, but you know, this, this is a very helpful way of figuring, er figuring out errors. So for example, if you're trying to make a program that uses the quadratic function or the quadratic equation, and um, there's something wrong with the answer, the final answer that you get, but you just can't figure out where, you would um, output different parts of like the equation just to see um, where one certain part of the equation might be wrong. So for example, it's like negative b plus or minus um, square root. So square root of b squared um, minus 4ac um, 4ac within the quadratic formula, right? And so you might um, put an output statement for you know kind of the middle part, where, which is like 4ac. So you might output that and see if that's the right answer or not. And if it's wrong, then you can tell, oh, that's where it's wrong. I can fix that. My answer will be right now. So that's kind of how important um, adding output statements can be. So moving on, um, now you should be able to correctly identify and connect an error within a program or algorithm. You should also be able to identify corresponding and expected um, outputs or behaviors that can be used to check the correctness of an algorithm or program. Um, and so now if you really can't yet, it's okay, don't never fear. Um, you're gonna be practicing these skills all throughout your um, school year. You know, you're gonna be making labs and so you're gonna have to naturally find problems within your code and that will make um, practice for the MCQ questions or MCQs much more helpful. So now open up table for questions and answers. Obviously this is a video because I accidentally did not record properly the first live stream, but um, in the Slack group, um, um, in the Fiveable Community Slack group, make sure to um, make sure to um, ask any questions that you have. Um, I'm always here for answers and yeah. That's pretty much it. Um, and then these are my notes and attributions and citations. And that is all, I believe. So thank you guys so much for um, watching this office hours. I hope it was really helpful. Um, next week I will be doing, or yeah, next week I will be doing the um, a big overview of multi, um, of big idea number two. So be on the lookout for that. Um, and I'm really excited for that. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you guys next time.